<laughs> I was instructed that our final speaker needs no introduction. <laughs> that sounds trite, but it's true. Here at the Land Institute, our next speaker is known as a visionary, an inspiration, and a guiding light. Not of just of the Land Institute, but of a growing movement. His life work has been to revolutionize agriculture and put it in its proper place at the right hand of nature. He pursues this goal with boundless energy and sharp focus. Most of you know him or know of him. So I offer no introduction other than to welcome to the lectern, Wes Jackson. I really like being clapped for. <laughs> Now I can just leave. <laughs> well, uh, the, the talks have been terrific, and this has been a terrific audience. Uh, it's always good to have an assembly of the people in this barn, all of whom are objective the right way. <laughs> uh, well, countless times I've heard criticism about utopian writings, including a piece I wrote in 78 for a conference at Cape Cod. The conference title was The Village as a Solar Ecology. My contribution was titled Outside the Solar Village, One Utopian Farm. And objections mostly center around the well-known reality that utopias seldom succeed. Uh, my utopian farm hasn't happened, so apparently the objectors are right. Nevertheless, utopias in one form or other keep coming up. And there's evidence that some have increased our collective imagination leading to change. A Thomas More's utopia appeared in 1516. 1516. Francis Bacon's New Atlantis appeared 111 years later, 1627. And both of these Englishmen placed their utopias on islands in the New World. 1492 is Columbus, so 1516 was soon after, and 1627, over 100 years after Thomas More's. Now both of these were Englishmen and they placed their island, uh, their utopias on islands in the New World. More's is in the Atlantic, not far from Brazil. Bacon's is in the Pacific, not far from Peru. And in More's utopia, the most important thing is agriculture. Everyone lives in the country. Everyone must farm for two years. Women and men work side by side. Unemployment is absent. All are free to worship as they please. Be it the sun, the moon, the planets, ancestors, what or whomever. Some are monotheistic. <clears throat> others not, and this sort of ecumenicalism is backed up by a common prayer that all can recite. Well, that was Thomas More. Bacon's island, called Ben Salem, features, quote, generosity and enlightenment, dignity and splendor, piety and public spirit, Nothing wrong with that so far. 
But the primary source of virtue on Ben Salem Island is of a fundamentally different order from that on Moore's Island. No one, knowing Bacon's other writings, would be surprised at the content of this novel, just as no one knowing B.F. Skinner's research would be surprised by his 1914 utopian Walden II. In New Atlantis, uh, Bacon's novel, we read what became a prototype for both pure and applied research. The novel, along with Bacon's other writings, became the early uh, how to do it standards that were adopted by the Royal Society, established a third of a century after New Atlantis in 1660. Now much has been gained by adherence to those standards. That said, Ben Salem, the uh, de facto mission statement, carries a problem. It says, in quotes, the end of our foundation is the knowledge of causes and secret motions of things now uh, here I've underlined what I'm about to say. The enlarging of the bounds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible. Now what's that mean? Cut down rainforests, drill in the Arctic, rip the tops off mountains, run a pipeline down the middle of a continent, build atomic bombs, explode them on civilian uh, populations. That idea, the enlarging of the bonds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible, vibrates right at the core of the Enlightenment, right in there with otherwise useful notions. Some have argued that Bacon's novel foreshadowed not only freedom of religion, but some key legal reforms like the abolition of slavery, women's rights, and free speech. Of course, nothing wrong with that sort of influence from a utopian novel. But he has to be taken seriously because he is one of the prime heroes of the Enlightenment. Hear what Jefferson had to say. Quoting Jefferson, Bacon, Locke, and Newton, I consider them as the three greatest men that have ever lived without any exception, and as having laid the foundation of those superstructures which have been raised in the physical and moral sciences. Now, as an aside, I don't know how many historians of science, science would agree that Bacon was the father of modern science. Albert Einstein certainly did not. He said it was the Englishman's contemporary Galileo, the main heretic of the time. Galileo's improvements of the telescope, his Copernican view, his house arrest, ground him high standing. He died in 1640 year, 42 the same year Newton was born. But whatever Einstein thought, parts of Bacon's New Atlantis are central to our subject today. Now nearly all of us are seeking ways to improve society, to improve the human condition, but what about, I'm gonna quote it again, enlarging the bonds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible. What about instead the necessity to recognize limits and act accordingly? A second major objection is Bacon's reductive approach to the world. And we've seen plenty of that. Uh, reductive thinking dominates when two molecules are used to solve a major problem. You want to know what it is? Yeah. <laughs> well, one of them is called the Roundup Ready gene. 
And the other, that's a DNA molecule, and the other is the herbicide Roundup to kill all but the crop that has that gene. Now today I want to talk about an island, more isolated than either of Moore's or Bacon's islands. It's an island in the cosmos. Technically, a utopia is not a place. It's a state of being, that is U-T-O-P-I-A. It's a state of being, but utopia, spelled E-U-T-O-P-I-A, is a place. And it is called Earth Island. So, for the next several minutes, I want to read some passages from Earth Island. I'll start at the beginning, I'll skip around. So, here it is. I'm reading from the novel Earth Island, which is not finished. Those of us on Earth Island have a common mission to protect it as an ecosphere. The effort is threefold protect Earth's crusts, protect Earth's waters, protect Earth's atmosphere. We rank ecosphere protection as the highest of all callings, and here are the reasons. The ecosphere holds precedence in time. It was here long before we were. It holds precedence in inclusiveness. We are embedded within it. It holds precedence in complexity of organization. It is far more complex than we are. It is more creative. Its evolutionary creativity has given rise to all biota, including us. It has precedence in diversity. In our educational efforts on Earth Island, we teach the young that nothing is more important than to comprehend the overarching supra-organismic reality we call the ecosphere. S-U-P-R-A, not super, supra-organismic. To say organismic then is placing priority on organism over the whole. Now there's a hierarchy within the ecosphere. At the next below, level below are all of Earth Island's ecosystems. Some are water-based, some land-based, but all are seamlessly connected. Because we humans are primarily land animals, land is central, but we don't stop there. We land dwellers have to pay attention to the oceans and other water-based ecosystems as well because of the seamlessness of it all. 